And you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Perfect. So what I would like to show you in the next couple of minutes is uh, basically Omero's 3D script, which is a new software basically to marry Omero and 3D script. And it's implemented as an Omero web app uh, to uh, directly create 3D animations uh, on the Omero server. And the good news is that it should be as easy as ordering a pizza, as you will see in a second. And the best thing about it is that you don't even need a high-end graphics uh, workstation for it, but it should also work uh, on your mobile phone, at least uh, if you're the end user. Um, so how should that work? Like in general, if you want to create 3D animations, uh, you all know uh, this can be quite computationally demanding. And if your data size increases a couple of hundreds of megabytes, uh, dedicated hardware is uh, required or becomes necessary. And so we were asking ourselves uh, if there wasn't a way to outsource these rendering and animation to a dedicated, well, let's call it animation server. And uh, so maybe similar as you would outsource your daily cooking business in case your kitchen lacks the required uh, equipment. And so actually many labs uh, have for this purpose a dedicated workstation uh, that's shared between lab members, which they use for processing and visualization. But this is not what I'm talking about here. That's like uh, renting a kitchen and then do the pizza on our own. What we were thinking about is more like we would like to order a pizza from remote. And once the rendering is done, we would uh, like to get the result back. And once we have such a system uh, ready, of course, uh, several people should be able to join and uh, should be able to use this service. And there's one uh, really important thing, and that's if we want to implement such a system, we need uh, to provide uh, the user a way to specify what the animation should look like. So uh, what to animate and how to animate and uh, what to expect in the end. And um, so in a way, this is uh, again like um, ordering a pizza because uh, if we want to order pizza, we need to specify what we want to get back in the end. And um, so we'll see that uh, this uh, has indeed some similarities. So, um, sorry, I lost uh, my uh, thing here. Um, So uh, the crucial part is really that uh, we need to provide this way. And uh, the thing how conventionally 3D animations are done is by using keyframes. And so keyframes in practice uh, means that the user sits uh, in front of his computer. He uses his favorite 3D animation software and sets up a number of keyframes, basically setting up a 3D environment for consecutive time points and then the rendering engine would uh, um, interpolate between the different time points and create smooth transitions, which in the end yield the final animation. And so nice, so we can send a set of keyframes to the server, but this is actually not working because keyframes, as I said, are created interactively. And uh, that's exactly what we want to avoid. So the client should be free of any need of special hardware. And so we can actually not create these keyframes. This is a little bit, if we go back to the pizza, like making the pizza on our own, just to be able to show it to our pizza baker and say what we want. So, uh, and this is actually where 3D script then comes in. In 3D script, it's not keyframes anymore, which specify an animation, but it's text, it's English sentences, exactly as you see it here, like from frame zero to frame two, 720, rotate by 720 degrees horizontally. So it is something that we intuitively understand. And so one such sentence, or I will also call it instruction, uh, provides an animation element, I would say, and then we can add more sentences to it to make it arbitrarily complex and to have the animation uh, precisely do what we want it to do in the end. 
the important thing is here that it's only this text which we need to provide from the client side. So we actually don't need any hardware. We can just use any text editor to create this text. And the second important thing here is that even without having any rendering feedback, we can un intuitively understand what this text means and what the result may look like in the end. And so again, this is very similar to ordering pizza because also there we are using English sentences to order the pizza. And just by providing some information about the size and the ingredients, we have quite a good estimate of uh, what we will get back in the end. And so uh, 3D, uh, the script itself is implemented as a Fiji plugin. And uh, so I would now first introduce you to the Fiji plugin to give you an overview over its features before I then head over to Omero's 3D script itself. So um, for that, I have already opened Fiji and I will now open one of my favorite images. Here we go. So what you see here is an image of an intestinal organ organoid. In red, you see the nuclei and in green, you see the interferon gamma, which is attached to the membranes. And uh, just quickly before I start a 3D script, I will adjust the contrast in Fiji. So uh, the red channel seems fine, but the green channel uh, will need some strengthening. So I will just go to the brightest plane and once hit auto here. Here we go. Uh, and then I can start up a 3D script. And when I do so, I get two new uh, windows once it started, here we go. And there's once this uh, window here, which provides an interactive 3D preview. And there's a control window here. So I can interact with this preview window. I can just drag with my mouse. When I keep the shift key pressed, I can move the content around and I can zoom in and zoom out with my mouse uh, scroll wheel. And then on the control window, I uh, have several parameters which I can adjust so that the outcome actually fits my needs. And so this control window is subdivided into several panels. It's contrast, transformation, copying, bookmarks, output, and animation. And I will quickly walk you through um, all of them. So let's maybe start with the rendering algorithm. So we have a choice here between independent transparency which means that each channel is rendered individually. And so one channel doesn't affect the other one, as opposed to combined transparency, where, um, for example, an opaque pixel in one channel would hide uh, uh, pixels in other channels. So when I switch, you will actually see the difference. So that's the independent, that's the combined uh, transparency. Then we have here a slider, one for each channel. And these sliders are just to linearly fade out and fade in uh, a channel. And we can also double click these sliders uh, to get a color picker, which allows me to change uh, the uh, foreground color of that channel. So we could, for example, make the membranes red and I could make the nuclei blue. And I can also use this uh, color picker to change the background color. So I could make this then gray, whatever. For now, I think I would just stick with the black. And then we have a set of six numbers basically, uh, and that's per channel. So right now I'm only looking at the nuclei channel. And uh, the first row of these numbers just uh, concerns the contrast. And if I quickly go back to the contrast adjuster in Fiji, you can see that uh, this is a 3D script is actually picking up these numbers from Fiji. So the minimum, basically our black point is here 50, which means it's fully black. And the white point in this case is uh, 3000. Uh, that's what you specify in Fiji as well. In 3D script, we have an additional param parameter, which is called a gamma parameter, which lets me highlight or suppress the midtones. So I can just scroll in here uh, to highlight values in the middle range. 
And then we have uh, an additional set of three numbers here for it's called alpha, it's basically opacity. And so the minimum specifies here when a pixel is fully transparent, the maximum specifies when a pixel is fully opaque. And also here we have uh, a gamma value. And so, as I said, this is uh, per channel and just to see how, how this works in practice when I turn, so like, let me maybe just look at the blue channel right now. So I would say from, from this side, this looks ra rather nice, but if I turn it around, the back side looks a little bit dim. So to get this brighter, I could reduce my maximum uh, here to uh, in uh, enlarge the contrast. But since here we already have some saturated pixels, I would rather uh, decrease the gamma value here. And then I also see that in some parts here, some nuclei are missing which I can back by also decreasing the gamma for the transparency channel. So you see how this changes when I go forward and backward. And so I would just pick what looks best in my eyes, maybe like this. And so I think this is, this is good for the blue channel now. And then let's also look quickly at the red channel. And also here, I think I would, so I switch here to channel two for the red channel. And also here I would reduce the gamma to make it more transparent and also the gamma for the brightness to make it a little bit more bright. Also, I have the impression that we have some background here which I would cut off by just uh, increasing the minima here. So something like this. And now we can just go back and overlay both channels. And I think that looks uh, pretty nice actually. So uh, there's one more parameter that we can adjust here in the contrast panel, and that's light. And to show it to you, I will go back to the blue channel maybe and fade out the uh, red one. So when I enable the light, you see that I get four different numbers here, which are just the different parameters of the light. The object light is what's currently on, but we can add some diffuse component here and reduce the object uh, light a little bit. And you see this light casts local shadows on this volume so that it looks more like a surface actually, almost like metal. And that's again per channel. So I can do this on a channel basis. For now, I will disable this again and bring my red channel back. And this is it basically for the contrast settings. That's where you can actually spend most of the time because this basically tells what our rendering looks like in the end. We have a transformation panel here, which just shows the information about the current rotation and translation and scale. I can also modify uh, these numbers uh, on the control window. And of course I can also reset it uh, to bring me back to the uh, identity transformation. There's a copying panel. And um, this allows me to crop the data from all different sites. So these are double sliders, so I can, I can drag them from both ends and I can crop in all uh, original directions. And uh, in addition to that, I can also crop along the viewing axis uh, parallel to the screen. And if I click away this apply to all channels checkbox, I can also crop uh, individual channels and it's always cropping the channel which is selected up here. So in, in my case, it's channel one, which is the nuclei. So they will be cropped away as I move these sliders now. There's the bookmarks panel, which I will just ignore for today. There's an output panel which uh, lets me uh, specify the output size of, of my rendering. Uh, I can hide the bounding box and I can also hide the scale bar or change the properties. For example, I can specify the length of the scale bar and I can also attach it to the object itself if I wish. So uh, then it appears here, it's like a 3D scale bar. So this is basically all the parameters which I can uh, change in the integrated uh, 3D renderer. And all of these numbers can be animated over time using the 3D script animation language. And to do so, I will 
open the animation text editor. So this text editor looks like the Fiji script editor, if you know it, and basically it reuses the Fiji script editor, but it is dedicated to creating uh, the animation text, as you will see in a second. So uh, now we need to enter these instructions and uh, the question is, how do I start? And basically the only thing which you need to remember is F. So once you type F, everything else will ha happen automatically since this is fully auto completion enabled. So from frame, I will enter a number here, zero, two frame, for example, 100. So frame here means it's a frame in the video which we will create. So what I'm saying here uh, is I want to do something within the first 100 frames of the video, which I will create. And so for now, I will just rotate by 360 degrees. And whenever I, I hit space, the auto completion uh, comes in action again. Uh, I rotate vertically, and then I can additionally add one of these uh, animation keyboards. If I use none or linear, this means it will just be a, a constant speed. If I use ease in out or just ease, this means it will start slowly, then accelerate, and towards the end, it will decelerate and stop slowly again. Ease in means it's uh, accelerating at the beginning, but stop uh, stops con with constant speed, and ease out uh, vice versa. So for now, I would just use ease in out maybe. And once I have my text ready here, I can click the run button and you see um, that's what happens now. So a new window opens up, uh, which is basically my animation. I can run it again here in Fiji and that's what it looks like right now. Uh, we'll just close it now and we can add uh, more sentences. So we can say from frame zero to frame 100. So I'm uh, using the same frame interval right now. Uh, and this time, maybe we just zoom by a factor of two. And maybe again, we do the ease in out. And let's quickly see what we get now. So now we are rotating and zooming at the same time. Um, whenever I have an action which acts in the same frame interval, I can write this uh, slightly more concisely, uh, which makes it easier to read and easier to write. So I can write it in this enumeration way, something like this. So this will work uh, as it used to work before, just uh, looks different. And uh, now we can also add different instructions. So for example, we can maybe this time use a different frame interval, let's say from frame 50 two frame, maybe 130. And so what else can we do? We can translate, we can zoom, uh, we can reset the transformation and we can change. And change basically means all the numbers which I have here in 3D script, I can change. So let's see what this is. Let me move it a little bit. So we have general parameters, for example, background color, time point if we want to change the time point in a time lapse uh, data set the rendering algorithm which we have seen up here the scale bar properties which we have had here and also the bounding box properties and additionally we have uh, properties which belong to a specific channel which is basically all the contrast uh, properties up here and all the cropping pr uh, parameters which we have here and either we can change these for all channels simultaneously or for an individual channel, which is what I'll do now. So let's say channel, I specify which channel. So let's say channel one, our nuclei. And I will change now bounding box min Z, which is basically the lower end of the Z range. So it's uh, this number here. I will increase it from zero to 100, which basically means I will cut it away in set direction. So let me just enter it now. Bounding box min set. And I will increase it to 100. And let's see what it looks like now. So you see, we still have the rotation and the zoom. And additionally, uh, the nuclei channel is cropped away in set direction as, as we go along. 
So now there might be one surprise if you run this again. Well, we'll just click on run again and you see next time you run it, the nuclei are already gone. So they are, don't appear uh, by itself. And this is because in our current state, uh, this uh, lower end of the set range is actually 100. So either I reset it or every time manually here, which is, is not really convenient, or I do it in the script and I can do it by just going here to the beginning. And this time I'm not specifying an interval, but the time point. So I use A, eight at frame zero at the beginning of the video. Change channel one, bounding box, min set to zero to reset it. So this will work. Uh, however, there's a nicer way to do it, so I will just delete it again. And the nicer way basically is that I do it once manually here. And then I can go uh, to record and click record cropping. And what this does is it basically inserts all the necessary statements to set the cropping to what it is currently in, uh, in the current state. I just need to specify at which frame and we do it at the beginning of the video at frame zero. And now I can basically click run as often as I want and the blue channel will be back again. So uh, one more thing is that uh, right now, as you, as you see here, all the animations uh, start with the, uh, basically with the identity transformation. So it, it always starts from the initial orientation and we also might want to change this. So what if we, let me reset this. What if we want to start our transformation from this orientation? And the answer is we can just adjust it here interactively. And then again, we go to the beginning of this text and say record transformation. Again, it will insert all these lines which are necessary to bring it into that orientation. We'll do it at the beginning again. And only afterwards, it will apply the other transformation which we have set up previously. Now, when I run it, you can see it starts indeed from, from that changed orientation. Um, and now, if you watched me carefully, you saw that there's an additional entry in this menu here, which is record contrast. And I would always recommend to also do this. Record contrast means that all the numbers which we had changed up here will also be recorded in this uh, text, which means, so this is really the key point of 3D script because this means now whenever we run this script again, it will exactly look the same. So this is nice because it makes it reproducible, but it is also nice because now this text alone, which is just based probably a couple of bytes, fully specifies the animation which we will get in the end. And of course I can uh, save this text and load it next time and just reuse it. So let's also run it now, nothing changed basically, but this is now my final version. So uh, right now I have uh, done everything in, in the Fiji plugin, which means I need a powerful computer, powerful enough to actually uh, do the animation here on my local machine. Uh, but uh, what if I don't have this? And that's where our idea comes from to implement a 3D script also for Omero to directly run it on the Omero server. And to show you how this looks like, I will just go to my uh, demo server here. I have some uh, data here. You may recognize maybe uh, this organoid, which is exactly the one which we used before. And now I can either right click, open with and uh, click on 3D script, or I can enter 3D script here from the top links. I will do it this way here now. And you see uh, a new tab here now in my web browser, which uh, is built up very easily on purpose. So all that we see is now basically the title of the image, which are, we are currently working on a panel which shows a preview video, if there exists one, not yet. A progress bar, which gives us some feedback about the progress and a dedicated uh, text field to enter the animation text. 
And when I, well, the, it contains already some text by default, and the easiest thing that I can do now is just click on render. And so it opens the data set on the server, it renders it, you can see how it uh, progresses, it saves it, it converts it, and now it attaches it, and we get a preview of the video which we just created. And all of this is directly done on the Omero server. So I can do it with whatever hardware uh, on my side, on the client side. Uh, while this is shown here, it is also uh, um, attached to the, to the original image. So if I uh, click on refresh once, you'll see that I have now three attachments. It's one, the text, which was used to, uh, to create the animation, the video, the MP4 file, and uh, PNG, which is just a still poster image for the video. And so uh, just to show you, so this uh, text field also can do some auto -completion, uh, completion to just help the user to enter this text. So I can, for example, say at frame zero, change rendering algorithm to combine transparency, just keep it simple now. And I click render and that's what I get. Of course, I can also go back to my uh, Fiji text, which I created before and just copy it and paste it in here. And ideally I would hope now that I get in the very same video and I hope that's also uh, what I can show you. So it's doing it. And you see it looks exactly the same because it's using the same text and it's fully reproducible. And of course, uh, you have seen when I opened my web client, so this contains a lot of images which were taken under the very same conditions. So what I can do now is I can just select a couple of them. So let's say I take the first six ones and uh, I go to the right side here on this chain symbol and copy this link to these images. So this is how you also do it in a mirror figure. And then I go back to 3D script. I click this little edit icon uh, up here next to the title. And I enter this link to these uh, images. And when I click render now, you can actually watch it as it opens all of these images one after another and rendering it and creating the animations. And so all of this basically happens with a single click, which I think is really convenient. And uh, at the same time, and this is really important, it uses in the very same rendering settings because this is also what we recorded here. So these, uh, all these videos will be uh, created with the very same settings, which means they are directly comparable to each other. And when we can directly look at these videos and see whether we can, for example, spot some uh, phenotypical differences between these acquisitions. And uh, by the way, I could also leave this site now. So uh, because everything will happens on the server, so it will not be aborted when I leave this site, but it will continue working. And since all videos are anyway attached to the images, it's basically where I can now uh, go away and do some, some other work if I wish. And once this is done, so there's also a, like a, a button here to animate all of them. And so here you basically see the result. With that, let me quickly go back to my, um, to my slides. So I hope you all agree that this is incredibly easy to create 3D animations like this. I, I think it's even easier than ordering a pizza probably. And with that, I would like to thank my lovely colleagues at the Optical Imaging Center. It's really a great atmosphere here. And Ralph, yeah, I really enjoy being here. I would also really thank Will Moore, who helped me a lot with the implementation of the uh, web uh, uh, app, and also the entire Omero team for providing this wonderful uh, platform. And um, I have a slide with uh, some resources. So there's the uh, original publication of 3D script. We have also a manuscript ready for the uh, server implementation. This is currently under review. There's the original 3D script homepage. 
the source code on GitHub, a manual on the GitHub wiki. There's a really detailed tutorial. It's a three hours video, uh, which I presented last year on the image to knowledge uh, meeting. And um, there is also a GitHub page for Miro 3D script uh, with information about how to install it on your Miro server. And finally, there's an Omero server, which I set up as a demo server. I, I would invite you to just uh, try it out yourself. So you can use this link uh, down here. Uh, you don't need to log in. There's a public user enabled and you can just uh, try it out on your own. And with that, I uh, would like to thank you to join me today. And if there are questions, of course, then uh, just ask me either now or just find me somewhere around and ask me later. Uh, Josh put a warning, uh, we put it back to yeah, the I main room, so, so we might um, be short yeah. in terms of time for question. Yeah. yeah.